I just wanted to introduce Dr. Sandy Chung. Um, Dr. Chung is the president for the Virginia chapter of the AAP and chief executive officer of Trusted Doctors, a large pediatric primary group in Northern Virginia. She's active in state and national organizations advocating for children's health and currently serves as the chair of the Virginia Foundation of Healthy Youth Board of Trustees and is a member of Children's Health Insurance Program Ad Advisory Committee for Virginia. This is a mouthful. Um, also, Dr. Chung serves as District Director for the Medical Society of Virginia and is past president for the Medical Society of Northern Virginia and serves on the Connect Virginia Governing Board and the National Advisory Council for Care Quality. She is an associate professor at VCU Health Sciences and associate professor at Georgetown University School of Medicine. Her interests include health information technology, that's why we were talking about my Apple Watch, she's a techie apparently, <laughs> health policy, practice management, and advocacy for children and pediatricians. Please welcome Dr. Chung. Thank you. Thank you guys. So let's see if this works. So first of all, can you hear me okay? Yeah, oh, good, exciting. All right, step one, done. Um, Oh, step two, done. All right, great. So basically, um, so I wanted to thank you all for having me today. I'm so excited that you're here in the room. I was very uh, concerned when it said Virginia chapter updates that any, you know, is anybody gonna come? You know, so, <laughs> uh, but the value-based care portion hopefully will be of interest and to hear more about what's happening in our state with our state chapter. Um, if I could uh, just have you raise your hands. Um, how many are pediatricians? Right, and how many are nurse practitioners? PAs? Family docs or in anything else? Who, who else is in the room? Do we have nurses? Uh, no, oh, great, oh, good. So fantastic. Well, it just helps me to see who's here. Um, I love this hotel. Um, this is the prettiest hotel in Virginia, I think. It is amazing. And coming down during the holidays is even better. I was actually just here a month ago for a meeting and, and just, you know, we, how it works. You know, Thanksgiving happens and it's holidays, right? So here we are. Um, so I, just to give you some background, she gave some great uh, professional background on me, but I am a Virginian. I grew up in Richmond. I uh, went to school at UVA. I um, did my rotation in uh, Salem uh, for internal medicine. I did my family practice down in Abington, uh, my outpatient rotation down there in Abington, um, and I now live in Northern Virginia. So I, I have a lot of interest in the entirety of the state, and I vacation in Virginia Beach. So, you know, so I got it all. All right, so I'm gonna do uh, several little talks. Okay, so I apologize ahead of time if it seems a little fragmented, but I, there's so many things I want to cover. Um, I really took sort of the best of all the different things going on. So I'll let you know when we're changing topics a little so it's not too disjointed. Um, and then if you have any questions, feel free to just raise your hand at any point, please. So, um, so our first our disclosure statement, I don't get any money from anybody, um, we're, we're okay. So some hot topics in our states, and these hopefully won't be a surprise to you. We uh, did uh, you know, some surveys of our members, and these are some topics that came up as being important to pediatricians, nurse practitioners, nurses, really medical <laughs> providers who deal with children uh, in our state. So substance use, nutrition, gun safety, vaccines, Medicaid, okay? Um, but you'll see one that's not up there is mental health. Uh, and that, I think, has come to more, further and further to the top as we've gone around and talked to people and as we understand that when you look behind some of these things, mental health is a part of a lot of them, right? So it's an underlying condition and we'll, we'll talk more about that as well. But first, we're gonna have you do an activity. So if you have a device that can connect to the internet, if you could pull that out. And if you wouldn't mind going to this survey and go ahead, it's very quick, it's like two questions. Um, because what I want to do is to make sure that whatever the chapter's doing, we're doing what you're interested in. I want to make sure that what we're working on speaks to everybody and is important to everybody in our state. Hopefully everyone can see it. I would have to move up front. <laughs> so. Great. Hopefully everyone got the address and everybody good with the, I'm gonna switch the slides. So, okay, great. Um, so, you know, I don't mind you being on your phone when we're talking, I, I do that all the time at talks. I know you're listening, so it's fine. Um, so, um, so one thing I wanted to invite you all to is our Pediatric White Coat Day. What this is, I'll, I'll show you. We, January 17th, and that should say 2019. 
so January 17th, 2019, so this coming January, uh, all the pediatricians, nurse practitioners, PAs, anyone who has an interest in child health will come together and then we're going to go and visit our legislators. And we're going to help educate them on what's important for pediatrics. And really, it's one of those things, if you have the time and you're able to come, it's really an amazing experience. So it's a white coat day, so first you have to find your white coat. I didn't have, I had mine from residency. Um, and it's so basically, if you don't have one, we'll find you one. And you come down and we work together. So if you've never done it before, we will come with you. But it's really meeting with the legislators. And if you think about it, it's very similar to talking to a patient. So when you're talking to a patient, you're educating them on the importance of sleep, nutrition, et cetera. And, and when you're talking to a legislator, you're doing the same thing about whatever topic we're interested in, because most of these legislators are not in healthcare. But yet, they're voting on healthcare issues, right? So it's very important that they have all the information, and we are the best people to provide that information, because uh, we live and breathe this every day. And I'll give you an example. I visited a legislator, and we were talking about um, vaccines. No, no, we were talking about immunizations. I said, why, you know, I wanna talk to you, you know, let's talk about the importance of immunizations. And he asked me, well, how is that different than vaccines? So it's really one of those things where, you know, there just wasn't that knowledge of what was going on. And, and of course, most of them are much smarter than that, but this particular person was voting on something that was very important to us. Um, so again, it's just super important to, to go down there and really just teach, and, and that we do that very well, we do that every day. These are some of the things that we've passed in the past. And, and these, uh, these laws, like no smoking in cars, uh, safety caps on the liquid nico nicotine containers, uh, protecting recess in schools, um, payment while awaiting credentialing, meaning if you're a new provider and you're being credentialed with an insurance company, in the past they wouldn't pay you until you got fully credentialed. But this past year we got legislation passed that said um, as soon as we apply from that date forward, you can do the credentialing process. When it's done, you're gonna pay us back for when we started work. And so that was, that was huge. Uh, protecting against raw milk sales, where basically it's unpasteurized milk. So lots of these things. And these are things that, uh, and another one is, a good one is no smoking in restaurants. That started with a pediatrician. Okay, and so we're all used to that now, right? But that started because a pediatrician had a great idea, and then we all got behind it, we all voted, you know, and we all went down, we talked to the legislators, the legislators believed in the same idea, and we got it passed, so it's huge. So if you have an idea, I would invite you to contact us at the chapter. Even if you're like, well, I don't know how to do this, but wouldn't it be great as, uh, so for example, a pediatrician, and I don't know if this will go through, but we're gonna work on it, uh, he said, I put my three-year-old on a bus today for a field trip, and there were no seat belts. Right, so sure, there's a huge fiscal note to that, right, if you had to retrofit every school bus, right? But can you imagine three-year-olds on a bus without seat belts? Well, that's a mess, right? That's, a, that's, a, that's an accident waiting to happen. I mean, it's really, even if the bus gets there, fine. I mean, the, you know, the kids are gonna be everywhere. So, so again, you know, things like that, if there's a good idea, please let us know, or if, even not, if you're just not sure, we will help you, and we will actually, if, if we have a legislative committee that I also invite you to be a part of, if you're interested, so if you're really interested in this and want to help sort of guide our agenda every year, then I would hugely, uh, really love your help to do that. So there's some things you can do though. Let's say you can't actually go take a day off of work, go to Richmond and advocate. Um, there are other ways that you can advocate. So there's that, there's our committee, um, and then there's just talking to your local legislators. You know, um, if you get a chance, if we um, put out a member alert, if you're not a member, please join, uh, and we put out a member alert and said, hey, we're working on mental health, this bill. You know, can you please write to your legislator to say support it? right, then we can, you know, that would be a huge help because they don't really care if I come up to your legislator and say, you know, I would like you to support blah, blah, blah. But if you say, I vote for you, or don't vote for you, whatever the case might be, um, and I'd like you to support whatever it is, okay, so um, that would be huge. Uh, nationally, if you're interested in sort of what's happening on the national landscape with pediatrics, emailing this right here, kidsfirst at aap.org, emailing them your interest, will put you on a list where essentially when there's something national going on, for example, right now they're looking at legislation that, uh, or they haven't looked at it, Trump has put forth, President Trump has put forth legislation that's expanding what they can do, what's being included in what's called um, public charge. Um, and there's gonna be issues tied to whether or not you accept public help. So what's public help? Well, it's Medicaid, it's SNAP, it's WIC, 
Um, right now, it's the def definition limit it, limits it to Medicaid. What they're looking at in Congress is to expand that to include SNAP and WIC. Okay, so if we expand that and now suddenly that's considered being a public charge, the question is, are, do we feel like our families are still gonna go and take those assistance? You know, do you think, well, they'll still do it or do you think that they're gonna be afraid to do it if that's now considered public charge? So, so I think that there are pieces like that where there's things happening nationally that if you have a strong feeling about either way, that there's an opportunity for you to learn about it. And that's really what being a key contact, AAP key contact means. So if you email that address, they will put you on the list. And then you can see what's going on and decide, you know, is it important or not? Do you want to write about it or not uh, to your congressman? And then we do have a PAC. So a PAC is basically funding, right? So we go and we will donate to a legislator's cause, perhaps, through their campaigns. Why do we do that? Well, we all know that in the world of politics, money does talk. Well, we're not talking about a lot of money. I mean, we don't have a lot of money. But the funny thing is, is that if you just donate $50, or $100, suddenly your phone call gets answered, you know? So it's really just the reality of the world is that we need some funding in order to be able to get into the door with some of the legislators. Um, and so if you're able to donate, we do actually at our table, the chapter table, we have envelopes there if you're interested, or, and certainly on our website, you can just donate online. Okay, switching topics. Medicaid. Okay, so who in here takes Medicaid or deals with Medicaid? Okay, so Medicaid is changing from straight Medicaid. So DMAS is the Department of Medicaid, uh, Medical Assistance Services really, but they are the ones who manage Medicaid. Starting tomorrow for you guys, all of the Medicaid patients are being switched to managed care organizations. Okay, you're the last in the state to have this happen to you, and I will tell you, it was not fun. We did this in Northern Virginia in October. It was really kind of a mess. Um, and so I just wanted to talk to you about it just so that you have an idea of what's going on. So what does this mean? So from Medicaid, they're saying that instead of just having straight Medicaid, we're going to give all the Medicaid patients and assign them to managed care organizations. And who are they? And, and they're saying, oh, it's gonna provide so much more choice, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this is who Medi all the Medicaid patients are going to now. Okay, so they're all going to be assigned tomorrow for you all um, to these six. So all six are all over the state. Okay, so how are they doing that? Well, the patients have an opportunity before tomorrow uh, to pick one. Okay, so I don't know how many of you think all of your patients went and picked one that you participate in or not, but I'll bet that you don't participate in all six. Because the only way you could have participated in all six is if three to six months ago, you knew about this and started the contracting process to be credentialed with all six. So what happened to us in Northern Virginia is that a lot of our patients didn't pick one and they were assigned to one, and they were assigned to ones we weren't in. So they showed up in our offices, wanting to have their well checks or getting their sick visits, and we didn't take their insurance. It was kind of a mess, okay? So what can you do? So as they've rolled it out through the state, they found the different issues. So each of these six have agreed to pay for a visit that occurs in the first 30 days of the go live. Not when they showed up in your office, from the go live. So your go live is tomorrow. So for the month of December, they will pay if one of your one of the patient one of your patients shows up in your office and they have an insurance that you don't participate in and the member has to call and switch it okay now your office can help them certainly okay but you'll need to make sure that your patients are aware of which ones you participate in because not everybody wants to be in all six quite frankly they are very different um, so my practice we're in um, two of them Actually, we're in three, but we're about to drop one. So, um, so we're, we're in two of them because all of these have different flavors and personalities, you know. So, um, really, I think it's so we sent letters to every single one of our Medicaid patients and said, These are the ones we participate in. Please make sure you call and switch. Okay. So, really important. If you've not heard of this, it is happening tomorrow for you guys. Um, and so, make sure that your patients are aware. All right. Now on to value-based care. 
So we're gonna talk a little bit about the way medicine's been, how it is now, and what's it, what is it gonna look like. So this is the cascade of healthcare challenges, all right? Now, expenses. So first of all, we know the cost of healthcare is going up across the country for everybody. It's not sustainable, we know that. So something needs to be done. We do need to participate in that, so what can we do? So national healthcare expenses are going up by 5.5% every single year, all right, with a projection of $5.7 trillion by 2026. So it's a stressful situation, right? Healthcare is, is stressful. Insurance is stressful. 72% of millennials say that healthcare insurance, that cost, is a stressor on them. Add to that this financial need. So if it's too expensive, then the cost has to go down. And who's the cost? But well, we know it's not us. <laughs> but that doesn't mean we're not gonna be held accountable for it, right? The health systems will be, the insurance companies will be, the pharmaceuticals will be, all of our industry is going to need to figure out how to solve this problem. So if hospitals don't change how they function today, then they could potentially be on the hook for a 16% loss in margins. That's big. Insurance. So what's changing? Well, the insurance company, the way that they're addressing this is they're switching to something called value-based payments. And the projection is that by 2020, so really in two years or a year and a half, 59% of everything that we're paid is gonna be value-based. Okay, that's a lot. And add to that burnout. Okay, so we have physicians and providers who are really experiencing symptoms of burnout. Studies have shown that 50% of physicians are showing symptoms of burnout. And then add to that that we're getting older. So 43% of physicians in this country are older than 55 years old. Okay, so if you've got this huge cohort of physicians going to retire, there are not that many residents being graduated to take their places. So the old world has us functioning in silos, right? So this is how we're used to practicing medicine. Patient goes to the doctor, patient deals with the insurance company, patient goes to the hospital, patient does this, that, and the other, all separate. Today, there's some efforts to start pulling that together, okay, so that we start communicating with each other, we start working together. And the goal is really in the future that the patient's in the middle and we work around them. Right, and so that we coordinate care, we all communicate with each other, we all know what happened in the other place and we know what's going on and the patient can just be the patient and we work in, in all in concert. So how is this happening? Well, there are several different movements that are happening in our country right now in healthcare. So the first is something called vertical integration. So I know the, type, the font's too tiny, um, don't worry about that, but look if you kind of look at the red highlights. So vertical integration, what is that? Well, Kaiser's a good model of that if you're familiar with that. So they have the insurance company, the hospital, the doctors, the lab, the pharmacy, they've got the whole gamut. Okay, so that's vertical integration. If you've heard about CVS and Aetna merging, right, that's an attempt at vertical integration. That's the payer and the pharmacy, and then they have their minute clinics, right? So that's vertical integration. So there are lots of, uh, lots of examples of this going on around the country. Employer activists. So you may have heard of the J.P. Morgan, Amazon, um, Berkshire Hathaway a collaborative. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's a collaborative where these three very large employers, so Amazon, J.P. Morgan, Berkshire Hathaway, have come together and said, you know what? We're smart. We're gonna, so we have a lot of employees we're gonna solve this healthcare problem because they're self-insured, so they're paying for all this healthcare. So they've actually hired uh, Atula Gawande, you may have heard him, of him as their CEO to run this initiative. So I really do think something's gonna happen out of that. It'll be very interesting. Um, and now Amazon's coming to Northern Virginia so that we will be very much in the, in the, uh, affected by this. Um, technology, right? So Google, Amazon, you know, we were just talking about the iWatch, right? Everybody's kind of getting into the healthcare game. And so the question is, what are we gonna do with all that technology? I don't know about you, you know, but as much as I like you, I don't really wanna know what your heart rate is every minute. <laughs> so, um, so, so really, you know what, it's great to have this, but what do you do with it, right? Um, and, and everyone's getting new devices that can do new things. So like the Pulse Ox, I don't know how many of you have a phone that can do a Pulse Ox. You know, I don't know if you played with it, I, you know, I played with it online. Is it accurate? It's pretty accurate. 
it's pretty good, right? And so what do you do when some patient calls up and says, hey, my pulse ox 88. <laughs> like, we'll go to the hospital. <laughs> but you know, so, <laughs> but it might be like, why don't you clean your screen first, you know, and right? And so, you know, are you blue? Are you talking to me? You know, so, so I think we really need to think about in healthcare, how are we gonna manage all these new devices and, and technology that's coming our way? Health retailers, right? We know Walmart and CVS and all the retailers are getting into the game. So value-based care is an interesting topic to me. I've done a lot of value-based care. So to give you an idea, they, she mentioned I'm CEO of something called Trusted Doctors. That's a large pediatric group. I'm also CEO of something called Health Connect IPA. In that, we have adult medicine groups. So we have 200 docs um, that are internists, family docs, pediatrics. And we've been doing value-based contracts for the last six years. And so I've learned quite a bit about what this means. And it's interesting to me, when I look up the definition of value, there's two definitions. So one is the worth of something, so the noun. So the worth of something, the quality of something, that's the value. But then there's the verb, that's the financial value of something, all right? And so I would submit that as providers, we're focused on the first one, the worth of our healthcare. Are we making a change? Or is it meaningful, is it impactful? Whereas the payers are looking at the second definition of value. Is it cheap? <laughs> right? Is it cost effective? Is it efficient? So really the colliding of those two definitions is kind of where we're at today. So when you look at value-based contracts, there's different pieces, right? Different levels of value-based contract. So the first is this fee-for-service. So this is where we've been. You see a patient, you get paid for the visit, we're done. The second is primary care incentives, and I don't know here, uh, do, you all, do you all have any value-based contracts that you're in now? Like how many are, you, are in these? Okay. So I will tell you that Northern Virginia and in Richmond, and starting in Virginia Beach, they're starting to have more and more of these, so it's coming. There's no question it's coming. It really started out in California, and like everything else, it just kind of sweeps the country, right? So, um, so right now, the, um, because the Medicaid world is changing, and you've got those companies coming in, you will be in this world, just by default, because all six are operating on all parts of the states. They're gonna have the same program, again, on all of them. And part of their contract is, re there is a requirement from the state of Virginia that all six MCOs must have a value component to their contracts. So if you're in Medicaid, you will be in a value-based contract at some point. If it's not this year, it'll be next year. So primary care incentives, so what is that? So primary care incentives is um, the medical home model. So you know, perhaps you're a certified medical home. If you're not, you have medical home-like um, services. Uh, so you get payment for just having that. The second is performance payment. So this is quality metrics. Okay, so for pediatrics, our quality metrics aren't too hard compared to adult ones, but they are important. So well visits, right, did your, so there's a metric, you know, did your children under two years old get at least six well visits? Okay, um, did, in your three to six year olds, did they get one well check a year? All the things that they're supposed to do, but now you're gonna be measured on it and you're gonna be held accountable for it, which means your payment will be held accountable to it. So. Uh, immunizations is another one. Um, doing a quick strap for a pharyngitis before you prescribe antibiotics. That's another pediatric one. Um, and then they're kind of trying to come up with new ones because part of it is when we're at AAP National too, talking to the payers, we're like, that's not quality. I mean, you know, doing a quick strap before prescribing antibiotics is a good idea and it should be done. But is that really the worth of a pediatrician? <laughs> that we did the swab, right? No, our worth is that we prevented obesity, we prevented mental health, we prevented all these expensive things that adults have, but how do you put that in dollars that a payer understands, right? And if you think about an insurance company, how long are you with a single insurance company as a patient? Maybe a year, maybe two, maybe three, and then you switch, right? So they're trying to look at short-term expenses, whereas pediatricians were very focused on long-term things, outcomes, right? So that, that conflict there is where we're trying to find some measures that make sense. So maybe screening tools, you know, or something, you know, something where we can have quality measures that make sense. So if you have any ideas, we're open to hearing them. Um, because really, as I said, in our state, we're at a prime opportunity to have some influence on what our Medicaid patients are going to be measured on, because each one of those insurance companies are developing their their programs right now. Um, so 
And the other piece is that Anthem is probably pretty big here because it is in most of Virginia. And so Anthem Health Keepers Plus is the biggest Medicaid program. The rollout to MCOs, they have, the state, has committed to all six companies that no one company is going to have more than 40% of the patients, which means your Anthem Health Keepers Plus patients today are going to be moved. That's what happened to us. We had mostly Anthem Health Keepers Plus in Northern Virginia, and all of a sudden, half of those got moved to these other five, and we only participated in one other one. So, so again, it was really, that's, it's kind of messy. You know? So again, super important that you learn about it, but also notify your patients of which ones you participate in. So if for, uh, for performance payments, if you do well, then you get some funding. funding. And this is not on top of your fee-for-service, just FYI. This is taking part of your fee-for-service and putting it on the hook so that you have to do the, meet these quality measures in order to get funding. Shared savings is the next step where essentially they project out how much your patient population is going to cost next year. And if you, as the primary care provider, are able to keep them out of the hospital, keep them out of the emergency room, then it'll cost less. And that difference, the insurance company will split with you, 50-50, 60-40, of course, they're the 60, we're the 40, you know, 80-20, um, you know, whatever the case might be. So that shared savings, again, is where, where we used to just get it for seeing the patient. Not only do we have to earn it by doing quality, but now we have to monitor the rest of their expenses. And it's not the expenses in your office, right? It's their specialist costs. It's their lab costs, their pharmacy costs, which is huge, uh, their inpatient costs. So now the primary care doctor, that office, is now responsible for all of that care, which is crazy, right? Because now we're the insurance company all of a sudden. But that's the reality of what value-based care is. Shared risk is even more exciting. So this is where you're actually on, uh, on the hook for all the costs of the patient. So if they project out that, you know, let's say this year the patient costs this, and next year they project that it'll cost this, but then the patient, your patient population costs this, right? It was a lot more expensive. That difference in extra expense, now you're going to share in that too. So now we're going to help pay for that cost of care because we didn't do a good job on making sure that they aren't so expensive, right? So that is the reality. There's a lot of, now typically a doctor's office isn't gonna be able to do that, right? But I will say health systems have been doing those. Um, and really this shared risk, a lot of, you may hear of um, big groups like Privia, for example, I don't know if they've been out here, but you know, they get private equity investors, so Wall Street stockholders to invest so they have money. I mean, you need, a, you need cushion, you need funding to do that. That's incredibly expensive. So that's happening now. So again, all these changes. So if you remember, by 2020, over half of our payments are gonna be tied to this, right? We kind of hope that they'll stay down here, but we know they won't. They're, most of them are right here, I would say, and some are here. This is really something that, at least if you're an independent provider, you're not going to be able to do on your own. But um, health systems certainly have looked at that. So this is the game, OK? It really is a game, in a way. It's patient lives. It's patient care. So I don't mean to be flippant about that. So if everyone just sort of understands I'm not an evil person. Um, so that, that really, uh, the, the success though in the financial side of this is a game because there, there has to be a way to succeed. And so this is the game that uh, I created. You're welcome to buy if you'd like. Um, so, uh, so you start here, the evil, evil uh, payer. Um, so here you, you get to move forward to because you met your quality measures. You get a little extra funding per member per month. So PMPM PM is per member per month, where basically an insurance company might give you a couple dollars per patient per month to take care of them and try to succeed. Um, then you go back to spaces because they put in some new metrics, right? You, you hire a care coordinator, you get to move forward one. Um, you, oh, it's going to be an all risk contract, you got to go back and start over. Um, and then maybe hopefully at the end of the game you achieve shared, achieve shared savings and you win. Okay, so that's the game. So how do you play the game? Well, care coordination. 
So who's familiar with care coordination? Any, anyone? Okay, good. So care coordination is a little different than case management. You know, when I first started this, I was thinking case management. Somebody who's going to go through, look up charts, and say, um, this patient can leave today, this patient should go, to, what, when are they going, you know, all of that. So it's, it's not quite the same, right? So this is more like um, if you have a nurse who, who follows up after somebody's been in the ER, you know, and calls them and says, how are you doing today? Did you get what you needed? Do you need help getting your medicines? And then helping them to get their medicines. Do you have an appointment with the specialist? Were you able to get that? Oh, if not, let me call. Let me get you an appointment with the specialist, right? So it, it's really patient, very patient focus and helping the family very directly. Um, and so, because when you look at a patient, they're trying to figure out what to do. It's just too much, right? It's too much to do. So you really need somebody to help them. So in my practice, we took someone who typically does advice for us, uh, so our advice nurse, because really she'd been doing a lot of that work already, and we changed her to a care coordinator. We did that probably, I would say, four or five years ago. At this point, we have two now. I mean, I do have a big group, but really, it's just such a full-time job because healthcare is so complicated, and patients really need help. So having that care coordinator has been important in, in succeeding. The other thing she does, if a patient went to the emergency room, she'll ask them. She'll be like, oh, did you know that we were open, you know, and that we could have managed this? Or an urgent care could have done this, too. Because I think what patients may not understand is the difference. Some don't understand the difference. The urgent care, the ER, it's just whatever's open right now. I need care. Okay? So using in-network radiology and lab. So if you're in a value-based contract, the in-network facilities are generally cheaper for the insurance company, okay, because they agree to being lower. So using, so I don't know as a primary care provider who's cheaper or who's more expensive, and nor do I care. I, I just don't have time, right? So, um, but the insurance companies know, and so those who are in network are the ones that are better to be using as far as cost goes. Assuming quality is the same, I would say. You know, if you think a, a one provider is better, then use that provider, but if, let's say all things being equal, right? Then you want to pick the one that is less expensive because your payment is now tied to that. If that makes sense? Okay. So uh, this is an example. This is on a public website, okay? They can't put the exact dollar amount that somebody's paid. That's not legal, uh, but they can put a range. So chest x-ray at this outpatient radiology site in Northern Virginia is 40 to $189. That same x-ray at the hospital is more than $189. The crazy thing is, I know who these people are, it's the same radiologist, okay? They just read the hospital, they're, they're situated, and they read the hospital x-rays, and they read the outpatient x-rays. Same doctors, you know, same technology, really. The cost is just totally different because of where they are sitting. A different time of day? No, no, yeah. Oh, well, if you don't have a choice, that's different. So more looking, so the reason why it's different, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. So the reason why it's different is that there's something called a facility fee where, where providers who are inpatient-based, um, they, so there's reasoning behind that. If you're inpatient and you're getting an x-ray done, they, uh, there's the normal charge, and then there's a facility fee. Now, that facility fee is designed to offset the free care that hospitals give. So it's not without reason. It's just when you're on the outpatient side and you have a, and it's an elective chest x-ray or something that's not urgent, right? Then choosing a facility that is not um, sitting on an inpatient base is cheaper because there is no facility fee added to that. Does that make sense? So yeah, and, and it's not, so time of day is more just there isn't really a choice. You know, so um, the emergency rooms are open. Um, it, maybe that's not what you were asking. Go no, ahead. I was actually asking. Oh. I was just, um, but your point is perfect. Oh, okay. There is a facility fee because the radiologists read the ER x rays at all times. All times. Sure. There, exactly. There is more cost associated. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I, so I, I, I think the problem here is what it's doing is it's pitting outpatient against inpatient. Right? So it's pitting hospitals against doctors and community providers, which it shouldn't do. But that, unfortunately, is kind of what's happening, right? And so the question is, how do we, so what some hospitals have done is they've partnered with the community providers, right? To say, okay, let's form a clinically integrated network, 
right? Let's all work together and figure this out so that we can all share in the success, right? Or that we can share in the, the, the risk, perhaps, too. So, okay. Um, so a CT is another example. So this outpatient radiology site, less than $462. The hospital, between $462 and $1,287. So again, the difference is just location in this case. Okay. So patient education and engagement, right, is also an issue, right? So patients, again, may not understand the difference between these different things. So I have a parent advisory group. And we asked our patients, our, par our parents, to say, what's the difference between urgent care and ER? And they're like, uh, we don't know. Is there a difference? Um, and I said, well, your copay is going to be different, right? So you have a higher copay if you go to the emergency room. And then you may have a lower copay if you go to an urgent care, typically, right? And they're like, oh, we didn't know that. And then also, the life-threatening things must go to the emergency room. Right, but those who are like, like your ear infections and such, if there's an alternative, going to an urgent care would be the way to succeed. And then having extended access. So as an office, if you have extended hours, you have weekend hours, you have walk-ins, all of that, then that also helps your patient population. Okay, so this is a different topic. Any other questions about value-based care? Okay, there's some good points raised. So we talked about mental health. Now this is the chapters working on this, and this is a program that I wanted to tell you all about because it's um, new and that your area is actually very much a part of. Um, so nationally mental health, one in five children has a diagnosable mental health disorder. 50% of these start when they're children. So 50% so by age 15, 75% by age 24. And most patients will see a primary care provider before they go to a psychiatrist or a, a behavioral health person. But 65% of pediatricians report that they don't know what to do or how to manage these disorders. So how about in Virginia? So in the state of mental health report, we're not doing so well. So we're 47th lowest in the country for the management of mental health disorders in children and adolescents. 12%, 12.5% of our kids who have had a major depressive episode have not gotten the care that they need. Well, 12.5% of our kids have had a major um, depressive episode, but we aren't very good about getting them care in that 70.8% of them haven't gotten the care that they needed. We are ranked 49th lowest in how we manage mental health in children and we have one of the highest rates of youth with alcohol dependence, marijuana use, and cocaine use. Um, opioids aren't even listed in this report, but you, we all know that's an issue. And then of those who got care, only 15.5% got consistent care. So what else? Why? Well, there aren't enough providers. We know that, right? So we're actually 42nd lowest in the country for the number of mental health providers, child psychiatrists, psychologists, this is per capita, of uh, children, counselors, therapists. Only two counties in our state have, a number, have enough child and adolescent psychiatrists per capita. That only covers 23,000 children in there. We have 1.9 million kids. So we really have an issue. And we did a survey, the Virginia Foundation for Healthy Youth and the Virginia Department of Health did a survey in 2017 that looked at, that we do it every two years, and we um, look at behaviors in middle and high school students. This is self-reported. And in that study, one in five girls and one in 10 boys said that they'd seriously contemplated suicide in the last 12 months. Yep, gonna show you right here. Yeah, so this is from the Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists, their national uh, society, and they do a workforce analysis every year. And so the green counties have enough per patient population. The yellow counties have some, but there's a shortage. The red counties really have a severe shortage. The gray counties don't have anybody, at least according to this website. So 65% of our counties don't have anybody. They might be, have access if they drove two hours, right? But as far as being in their county, there is nobody. So what are we going to do, right? Well, there's a program, this, this is a, a pediatric mental health access programs 
This is a, a model that has worked in over 20 other states in our country. The green ones have fully developed programs. The um, orange ones have partial programs. The yellow are just starting. And Virginia should be like this very light yellow because <laughs> we, we are now starting it. And so this is what it is. There's four parts. So there's education of primary care providers on how to do this work. Um, so there's something called the REACH program which we have been rolling out in different parts of the state. There's, we need funding for that, so we've been doing it by getting grants. That's really the only way the chapter can afford to do these. Um, and then, so as we start to teach primary care providers, so I did this program, the REACH program, it's amazing, really amazing, and really very helpful in teaching me how to handle mental health disorders. But what happened is in my practice, we started seeing patients and, doing, and taking care of that, but then we got to a point where we didn't know what to do, and we didn't know what to do. Right, because normally if I had a cardiology question, I would pick up the phone and call a cardiologist and say, what do I do? Will you see them, <laughs> you know? Uh, whereas the psychiatrist had the four month waiting list, right, they're, they're, and they were too busy. We did not have that relationship. So in these programs, there's a, a, a consult line essentially. So we're gonna have a statewide, this is happening in Virginia. So we're gonna have a statewide phone number where everyone can call no matter where you are. And then they will connect you to your region's team where you can then talk to a psychiatrist and say, I have this patient that has blah, 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 you know, what do you think I should do next? Okay, so that will help. And then telehealth, and, and certainly that's helpful for a patient who can't get to the psychiatrist. So let's say we decide the patient needs to be helped by a psychiatrist. How do we do that? This is embedded to the telehealth, where actually it's in the provider's office, okay? Because right now the way Medicaid pays for telehealth is the patient has to be in an office. They can't be at home. We're, we're trying to advocate so that patients can be at home, which would be so much better. But here they have to at least be at an office location. So it could be at a community services board location, it could be at a primary care doctor's location, uh, any of those. And then care coordinators. So right now, if a patient needs a psychologist who specializes in adolescents with anorexia, right now the way I do it is I give my patient a list and they say, here are some psychiatrists, here are some therapists, good luck. Or go to your website of your insurance company, hope there's somebody in network, call one of them. But we don't know if they know what they, you know, if they specialize in these conditions. So having care coordination locally, right, so that they are aware of who does what. Um, and then also what happens in these other state programs is they actually have special sort of backline hotline relationships because they know that if this care coordinator says this patient needs to be seen in the next two weeks, they mean it, um, and then they're able to get appointments. So to give you an idea, DC has one of these programs. They can talk to a psychiatrist, the primary care provider can call up a psychiatrist and get a call back in 30 minutes. And if the patient needs a visit, they can get a visit in two weeks. So, so different than what we have up there. I don't know what it's like down here, but up there, no, not happening. So what, what's your average wait time here? Do you, do you have any idea for a psychiatrist? Months, yeah, yeah, months. Okay, five months. So really uh, tremendous. So we have people, and so here, uh, Felicity Adams, is working with us, and we have people in all, all the different academic uh, centers, so Inova, VC, uh, no, VCU, UVA, Carilion, and CHKD working with us. We have a lot of support. So the Secretary of Health is supporting us, the Governor's supporting us, the Department of Medicaid, Department of Behavioral Health, uh, we have private insurers helping us, we have payers, uh, I mean, um, uh, community advocates, we have family advocates, we have a lot of people supporting this program. Um, so we're really excited. We did get a grant, actually, um, so let's see. I don't think I have that. So we did get a grant from the federal government to start it, so that's going to be helpful. We are advocating this year, in 2019, in January, to have funding in our state budget for this, at least for the first, well, for the whole thing, but we, we needed funding for first, the first year. So if you're interested, we could totally use your help. Your legislator is going to vote on this. Okay, so if we can get your legislators to vote yes for VMAP, Virginia Mental Health Access Program, that would be great. Yes? Yes. Yes, oh sure, yeah, and, and so those are just people who are on the committee now, so I think if there are people who are interested, that's the other thing, we're still looking for people who are interested. And we need regional teams too, so it's not that you need to travel to Richmond. Uh, if you want to, you certainly are welcome to, but we need regional teams, so we actually need people here 
that are going to help spearhead this in your region. So if you're interested, please let me know. Please let Jane know. Um, if you go to our AAP website, Virginia chapter, AAP website, it's virginiapediatrics.org, and then contact us, then you are on a committee. <laughs> um, so does it work? So MCPAP is Massachusetts model, and they did a study. They, they've had it for about 10 years now. And they did a study. So PCPs who strongly agree that now there's adequate access went from 5 to 33%. So that's not huge. But when you look at PCPs who now agree that they can meet the needs themselves, went from 8 to 63%. And the PCPs who now felt like they could reach a child psychiatrist from cons for consultation went from 8 to 80%, right? So that's what VMAP's for, okay? So, and that is very much underway. Um, so as much as you can support us, we would love it. Pilot's coming next year, okay? Um, how much time do I have? 10 minutes, okay, sorry. Okay. If people are Great. Or if they, if they yep. don't need a mission, or yep. for instance, it used to be if you needed to be started on site plans and not ERDs, you needed a mission. Mm -hmm. Didn't do that, but now she can start site plans and then follow them up with a community based Community psychiatrist. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So That's if, great. If you want to do what you're doing and yeah. get them before they have to go to the ER. Right. Absolutely, and taking a model just like that and rolling it out in the different regions. So what I found is that I've talked to different regions. Everybody's got really cool pilots, like or not pilots, but programs like that, right? And so, but everyone's got little pieces in different places, but no one has all of them, right? And so what we've worked with Felicity on is taking what they've been doing, you know, and uh, so is that Grambu, I guess, so they're in the same department yeah, then, okay. Um, taking models of what is working in each region and seeing if it's replicable in other places. So that, that's amazing. Yeah, you're lucky to have that. That's really great. Um, okay, so the last 10 minutes, we're gonna do a little whirlwind into the future, okay? So innovative care delivery. So telemedicine, uh, you're familiar with that. Um, it's convenient, it's low cost, patients want it. Um, personalized medicine, so genomics, right? So now if I know your genetics, I can pick medicines that work better for you. Um, that is not um, uh, not far off from the future. I don't know if you're doing that here at Corellian, but at Inova, every single baby that's born in Northern Virginia has their genetics done uh, for pharmacology, uh, pharmacogenomics it's called, so that we get, the pediatricians, get a list of how well they respond to medications. Um, now, the weird thing is that most of them are adult medicines, so I'm not sure how 40 years from now <laughs> The family doctor internist that sees this patient knows what's in my EMR, um, but I can tell you that you are a fast metabolizer of Coumadin, you know, I mean, so, uh, but there are some ADHD drugs on there, you know, opioids are on there. there, there are different drugs that are on that, so I just think that that's gonna keep moving forward and it'll be an interesting way to practice medicine going forward, personal wearables. Oh, uh, before I forget, labs at home, did you know that you can order a quick strap on Amazon? So the same McKesson test that we do in our offices, you can order that on Amazon. So we had that, we had a patient call and said, I did a quick trip on my child, it was positive. And they were like, how did you do that? Oh, I ordered it off of Amazon. So now we had to decide, do we believe that? Or do we make them come in, do another test? And then, you know, so um, it was, it, we made them come in. But you know, I think we, that may not be the strategy going forward. EMR based, uh, ER based triage or EMS based triage, so there are some cities in the country where they actually put a nurse practitioner or a, a physician on an ambulance. So they go to the house and then they determine does this person need to go to urgent care or do they need to go to the ER and then directing them to, and, or taking care of them right there. So uh, home visits, um, Uber does healthcare. I don't know if you know that. So they did this in DC and they did this in New York. Um, well, and they're still doing it, I guess. So the first year, this is about three years ago, they did flu shots. So you could schedule an Uber visit, they would come out, give your flu shot to you and all your friends, and I guess take you to the airport, I don't, I don't know. Um, but, but that was, and it was, and it was free. 
Okay, that was the kicker. So Uber came out to your office, gave flu shots to everybody around you, and you, and then uh, left, I guess. So, um, but they do Uber Healthcare now. So Uber Healthcare is um, you call Uber, they bring a doctor to you, and they'll take care of you. Um, it's not cheap. It's like two hundred and fifty dollars or something. You know, that's in New York. Um, and uh, but very interesting. You know, I, I just think there's going to be more and more of that. We've looked at the reverse. Oh, uh huh. And bring them to the care, right? Exactly, exactly. And that's very that's becoming more and more common now too. Um, and then direct to employer. So this is interesting. This is again in value based care. So if you're doing all the insurance work right now as a provider, right? You're controlling costs. You're managing this. You're man so why do we need the insurance company? You know. And so this is now going direct to employer, right? To say I will do this for your employees for this cost, which is 15% lower than the insurance company because now we don't have to pay for that, right? So this is happening in several states already. Um, and so that's gonna be a very interesting model going forward. Okay, so retail health. These are the people doing healthcare, like seeing patients. Okay, they may be doing it themselves. They may have wellness clinics or some employee-based clinics in their offices. Um, so there's just a lot of people delivering healthcare. And if you notice, um, our hospitals aren't on there and our practices aren't on there, right? These are everybody else delivering healthcare now. Um, so we really need to think about what are we going to do differently, and or you know maybe we'll just go work for these folks. I don't know. But if I, you know, there's just a lot of people doing healthcare. And so, and delivering care to patients directly. And so, really figuring out how do we fit. Whoops. You can't list your iPhone as your primary care physician, <laughs> but it is, is it not? I mean, Google is my doctor too. You know, I'm like, well, what is this? You know. So, you know, so really, um, primary care delivery, healthcare delivery is so different. Google is so fascinating. My brother actually works for Google, but the stuff that they do, like right now, there's this entity called DeepMind, and what they're looking, they're in the UK, and what they do is they're having uh, computers essentially read x-rays and radiology, CTs and MRIs, because the computer is able to pick up little blips quicker than or better than the human eye, you know? So if you're looking at early lesions, the systems, the machines are finding that better than we are, right? So it's just really interesting to think about what's gonna happen there. So telehealth, people want it, you know? 66% of Americans want to see doctors over video. 72% of parents with kids want to do this. 72% of those who are 45 to 54 want this, and 53% of those over 65 want to do this. Okay, so I do telehealth in my office, um, and we see patients that way. I would say it's an interesting experience. We, uh, it's not faster, right? There's a lot of technology, right? So it's trying to figure out, oh, I can't quite see your picture. Oh, it won't connect. So I end up being on the phone, right, while they're trying to fix their televideo. And then when we fix the televideo, right, I spend probably 10 minutes looking at stuffed animals and watching the kids run around, you know? And so I'm like, can we do our visit now? You know, <laughs> you know? So um, it's, it's really neat, but it's, it's got, the, you know, we have to figure out how to, how to do that well. Um, there are definitely people doing televideo, uh, you have televideo here, like the commercial services, where they go direct to consumer. Uh, $49, you get a visit. I don't know if you've seen that. Most of the health insurance companies have this now. So you pay for it, you swipe, put it into your credit card number basically at home and you get a visit. So that is uh, very much, it's really everywhere at this point. Um, we had a patient, an 18 month old, who did a televisit with an entity, it was ear pain. Okay, so the complaint was ear pain, 18 month old. Okay, so the complaint was ear pain in this 18-month-old, got a prescription for amoxicillin, did not do well, eventually ended up going to the doctor's office, it had Kawasaki's. So it was a huge lymph node causing the ear pain, you know. So it was not ear pain, it was not an ear infection. Child was hospitalized, did fine, but, but it, you know, the care, just not great. So we dug in, we said, who did this care? And it turned out it was an adult hematology oncology doctor in Minnesota who was licensed in Virginia. Who, who delivered that care. So really there's some standards that need to be created. <laughs> we, we've got a lot to work to do. Um, so pediatricians need to drive this. So here's another one. I hate this site. So this one, Lemonade. Basically you pick the disease you have. Okay, so acid reflux, acne, flu, if you've got the flu. You put in your information, your pharmacy information. They send in an e-prescription for the medication. There's no visit. Okay, so this is not legal in Virginia right now, so, but there are states, seven states who have this, 
right now. So there is a way to do telemedicine well, right? So we need, our, our biggest issue at my practice was the lack of the ability to do a physical exam, right? So we're beta testing this. Um, UVA is also doing this. So this thing's pretty cool. Um, so this is something a patient has at home. Okay, this is the stethoscope attachment. You plug it in. This is the otoscope attachment. You plug it in. This is the laryngoscope, the, I mean the pharyngoscope, so you plug it in. So I can see into an ear. I can see down the throat. I can hear the heart and lung sounds. It's pretty neat. Um, the lung sounds are okay. The heart sounds are amazing. Uh, the otoscope thing works if there's no wax, right? As soon as there's wax, you're like, well, I'm done. So, you know, and, and so it's one of those things, though, the technology is going to get better. What's interesting is this works really well for like the older, the school age kids, um, but the babies, obviously, you know in the office how hard it is to hold them studying the three adults at home. That's a challenge. Um, I had a two year old who had no problem, no problem, no problem. One time the mom poked it and it hurt the canal. So now the child won't let her near him with it now. So, um, so I think that you know there's more to come. This is you know one this FDA approved. It's really uh, it's expensive. It's like three hundred dollars. Um, but if you think about value based care and you're trying to prevent people from being expensive, if you paid three hundred dollars like the provider pay because we're the insurance company now, especially if you're in an at risk contract, and you pay three hundred dollars and gave this to everybody, right? And then they could do the care without having to go do expensive care. What an interesting world that is. This one I don't love, but so this one is an attachment. It goes on your iPhone or device. You take a picture of your tympanic membrane. You email that to a doctor in Georgia, and they will prescribe and diagnose the otitis that way. No heart, lung sounds, none of that. So, so I think there are different things definitely coming afoot. If you went to AAP NCE this year, there are a whole bunch of these, uh, the, especially this type, you know, iPhone visualization. So it's coming. Um, AI and robotics, you know, certainly there's this very interesting world where your Alexa devices and things. So this is called LifePod. This is something you put in a person's house, all over their house. Usually it's designed for elderly people. So instead of the push the button, help, I've fallen and I can't get up, you just say it to the air, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. Um, you know, so patients, so an EMS comes, right? Um, you're, if you're caring for an adult family member, you can just check in on them, right? And just talk to their house, okay? Um, and then this one is Mabu. She's a robot. She's in, she's in London. She's got eyeballs, so she can look at the gait of a person and the facial expressions of a person, usually, again, an elderly person, and get an idea of how healthy they are and talk to them. Say, how are you feeling today? Did you take your medicines? Do, you, you know, do I need to call for help? You know, and then, so it's very, very interesting. And then the last is drone delivery. This is in North Carolina and in San Francisco. So now in um, the Carolinas, they can deliver medications to the islands, the Outer Banks, right? And, and also blood products and lab tests back and forth to mainland. Um, and then San Francisco is using it for pharmaceutical delivery. So, so it's coming. So that's it. Um, so I wouldn't change the world for my children. I wouldn't change my children, but I wish I could change the world for them. So, um, so thank you guys. Appreciate your attention. Thanks for going with me on the ride. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Oh, we have a raffle. Okay, real quick.